This is William Appleton. He's a furry. This is Henry Emily. He's dressed like a minion, but not a furry. They both like making robots, so they team up to run a Chuck E. Cheese's starring the yellow bear in William's fursona. This restaurant was called Fred Bear's Family Diner, and it was located in Hurricane, Utah. And it did great at first. Everything was great. I just Until it wasn't. Mr. Appleton thought that human dancing was much better than Fred Bear, so he and Henry developed suits that could be worn by employees or used as standard animatronics. William spent so much time role-playing that Michael had to watch his younger brother 24-7, which made him angry, so he tried to scare him by putting him in Fred Bear's mouth. Thankfully, the suit was very well designed, so there was absolutely no danger. William Appleton was less than happy about the death of the kid, so he did what any logical person would do. He buried the body in his backyard and he tried to bury his grief and anger in more furry role-playing. Which didn't work, and he went completely mad and drove up to Henry's daughter, who had been pushed outside by some mean kids, which ultimately led to her being slain. And after the company miraculously survived, William Appleton and Henry Emily opened some Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria locations at some point in the early to mid-80s, with some quirky new characters. William Appleton was in his natural habitat, performing his favorite activity, furry role-playing when he realized that something was off about the security puppet animatronic. So he picked up a new hobby to test this hypothesis. He developed some new technology and started testing it out on his other son, Michael. He needed to recreate the circumstances of what happened to Charlie. The first was Susie. Okay, not that Susie, this one. And then there was Jeremy, Fritz, Gabriel, and Cassidy. To make sure he properly tested his theory, he put the kids very close to the animatronics. And they started behaving strangely too. All because William Appleton was somehow able to keep chugging along. He was never arrested for the missing children's incident, due to lack of evidence, but there was enough evidence for Henry to kick William out of the company. But as I said, the funny yellow rabbit man wasn't done yet. So in 1987, when Henry tried to rebrand with a newer and more secure location, William made his way back, somehow, as he always, always seems to do, return and he made five more children go missing all over again. Apparently in the exact same suit, according to the phone guy at least. Someone used one of the suits. We had a spare in the back, the yellow one. While the original animatronics started acting up again, the William sightings also caused the safe models to go haywire as well. Because it can be hard to tell if someone's a murderous furry at first glance. Which must be why William Appleton needed more. More subjects to further test his hypothesis before it could truly be called a theory. Using his infinite level of charm to get children to follow him like some kind of lagomorphic Pied Piper just wasn't yielding enough. He needed something more. Then he had it. The perfect plan. First, he needed to dismantle the animatronics that he had stuffed the children into all those years ago to harness the remains of all the pain that he had caused with his horrible deeds and make them into something bigger. So he returned to Freddy's and he dismantled Freddy Fazbear and company, but the souls of those whose lives he had ended cornered him. So he reverted to his comfort zone, his default state of being, but the rain had dripped into the suit. William Appleton's story was about to end where it started. And it all happened because even though he had literally died, William Appleton would eventually find some way to come back. Like he always does. I always return and explain. And Henry had heard that catchphrase, so he decided to seal up Springtrout's safe room and call it a day. There was just one issue. William told his daughter not to get close to her, but she disobeyed. William's bigger project that he needed extra children for in episode 4 turned out to be the Funtime animatronic. Funtime Foxy, Funtime Freddy, Blue Lobo, yeah. Sorry, I couldn't help myself. These were high-tech animatronics built exclusively to capture children, and the star of the show was Circus Baby, programmed to count how many people are in the room and enter death mode when there was only one person left. Elizabeth Appleton ended up alone with Baby, and now her soul was trapped in the killer machine. Michael had been applying to work at the same places as his father to make sure he didn't relapse into his illegal and furry tendencies again, but now Michael had no clue where he was, so he headed to his dad's secret bunker and found some instructions left by his father. Instructions telling him how to free Elizabeth and put her in timeout for being so naughty. And he decided to follow the instructions, because he knew that there had to be some way to put Elizabeth back together. And Michael Appleton knew he could do it, so he headed deep down into the bunker. He did a little bit of controlled shocking and things started to go horribly wrong really quickly. That night he started hearing the voice of his sister and didn't notice her strange obsession with the idea of pretending, so he decided to trust her. He followed all of her instructions day by day and watched his father's least favorite TV show in between shifts. Like furry father, like son, as they say, because on the fourth night Michael found himself trapped in a spring lock suit. He also met a psychotic bear, a robotic ballerina, whatever this is, a familiar looking pink and white fox, and a scooper. Wait! 
Was that the- It turns out that the voice that called Michael down into this underground location wasn't really his sister. It was a strange endoskeleton that had the ability to mimic voices to lure people to its lair. It climbed inside to swoop Michael and used his body as an exoskeleton until- The psychotic crew of characters were now free to roam the wild, and Michael was now dead. But he didn't let that stop him. Like his father, he willed himself back to life. Because Michael walked around as a purple corpse, still trying to find his out of control father, and the inner gang was also staying busy. They realized that Elizabeth was kind of a daddy's girl to say the least, so they kicked her out, and in response, she got a lobster claw and roller skate somehow. All of the following were now on the loose. A dude wearing a furry suit for the last 30 years, a Michael wearing his own dead purple skin for the same amount of time, a vaguely Freddy-shaped endoskeleton abomination, this, and a puppet. I'll call them the Scrap Squad. Henry saw all of this and decided that these individuals probably shouldn't have free reign over Utah, so he made a plan to end this. First, he trapped the puppet in a Freddy suit. Then he hired Mike to manage a new Freddy's restaurant. But here's the twist. It wasn't a restaurant. It was a metal box with a labyrinth of vents that looked like a pizzeria on the outside. Once all of the Scrap Squad ended up in this pizzeria simulator, he burned it all down and gave one of the hardest speeches ever spoken as all of the Scrap Gang smoldered. Actually, we technically never saw Lefty burn. Shut the up! What was I saying? Oh yeah, Henry's bonfire managed to set Mr. Afton's soul free. But before he got to his final destination, someone stopped him. He had committed many specific crimes, and those crimes earned him an eternity in a small office with 58 other furries, two of which were versions of himself. William probably could have handled 57 other furries, but 58 was an entirely different case. Please deposit five coins. They attacked him relentlessly, unless he managed to fend them off for 270 seconds, which Cause the cycle to restart. Please deposit five. It turned out that there were actually only two people here, Afton and the one he shouldn't have killed. This vengeful spirit was the one controlling all of the manifestations of Afton's animatronics, except for maybe the puppet, forcing him to endure this unbearable torment. Please deposit five coins. Who was this vengeful spirit? We aren't sure about their identity, but we do know which character they possess. Please deposit five coins. Occasionally, when Afton survived against almost all of the animatronics at max aggression, he would catch a glimpse of the remodeled Fredbear suit, twitching an extreme anger. The one that he shouldn't have killed that's been torturing him ever since. Fair warning, we're getting into some book lore here, which its canon as age of the games is a little iffy. This part of the video comes from Bunny Call Story, The Man in Room 1280. William may have been burnt to an absolute crisp, but he wasn't done yet, as the nurses at the Heracles Hospital soon found out. All readings indicated that this shell of a man was trapped in a nightmare, and there was an extra stream of consciousness in his brain, almost like there were two souls in there. He managed to communicate with Father Arthur Blythe, telling him that his final wish was to go to Fazbear Entertainment Distribution Center. Poor Arthur didn't know who this guy really was, so he worked tirelessly to convince the hospital staff to let him fulfill William's wish. When they finally said yes and Arthur took William to the distribution center, something strange happened. William exploded, and then an invisible kid infected Fetch, Elle the Doll, Foxy, and Plus Trap. And that's everything we somewhat confidently know.